Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. We are now just hours away from a strike that could do serious damage to the U.S. economy. The United Auto Workers and Detroit's three top automakers have till midnight tonight to agree on new labor contracts. Union President Sean Fain says they're making progress with Ford, General Motors and Stellantis, but are still far apart on key issues. From job security to ending tiers, from cost of living allowance to wage increases, We do not yet have offers on the table that reflect the sacrifice and contributions our members have made to these companies. Speaking on a Facebook and YouTube live stream, the UAW's Sean Fain says if they don't reach a deal in time, the workers will begin to strike at targeted locations. Meanwhile, Ford CEO Jim Farley spoke at a Mustang event at the Detroit Auto Show saying he still thinks a deal can get done. Still optimistic that we'll get a deal, but there is a limit. And uh, because we have to protect for the future, future investments and the profitability of the company funds those. Ford CEO Jim Farley says the union hasn't made a serious counteroffer to any of his company's proposals. Well, Nathan, we have another event that's impacting consumers this morning. A huge hack of casinos, Caesars and MGM, have been hacked by the same group within several weeks of each other. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has the story from San Francisco. Caesars Entertainment is expected to disclose details of the hack of its system soon, but Bloomberg sources say it looks to be tens of millions of dollars. The group behind the attack and the one on the MGM are attributed to a group known as Scattered Spider, or UNC. 3944. The Caesars hack first hit an outside vendor before gaining access to the company's network. Members of the group are believed to be young adults, some as young as 19 years of age, residing in the U.S. and the U.K. Hacking gangs typically ask to be paid in crypto. I'm Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. Ed, thanks. Turning to markets, shares of ARM begin trading later this morning on the NASDAQ. The chip designer backed by SoftBank priced its IPO at $51 per share, the top end of the range. Bloomberg's Julia Fioretti says ARM is valued at close to $55 billion. Um, it's still a hugely important deal for for um, for the IPO market globally. Almost a lot of people are looking at it. This is obviously a test also of the um, AI boom that we've seen, which has been powering the, this rally in the market. So a lot is riding on this uh, offering. Bloomberg's Julia Fioretti says the IPO is the world's biggest this year. Well, Nathan, tech tycoons gathered at a closed-door Senate meeting to shape how artificial intelligence is regulated. The meeting was organized by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. It included CEOs of Alphabet, Microsoft, Meta Platforms, and Elon Musk. The Tesla and ex-CEO talked with reporters after the meeting. The reason that I've been such an advocate for uh, AI safety in advance of sort of anything terrible happening is that I think the consequences of AI going wrong are, are severe. Um, so we have to be proactive rather than reactive. And meanwhile, Musk has agreed to try to settle claims by thousands of former Twitter employees who say they were cheated out of severance pay. That's according to a memo from a lawyer for the workers seen by Bloomberg News. The uh, X, the company formerly known as Twitter, has been accused in multiple suits of numerous labor and workplace violations, including failing to pay severance to thousands who were fired late last year after Musk's $44 billion acquisition. Well, Nathan, we have plenty of financial news to get you caught up on this morning. Bloomberg News has learned Goldman Sachs has fired transaction banking executives, including the head of the business, over compliance lapses. And Citigroup is preparing for a wave of job cuts. The CEO, Jane Fraser, is looking to restructure the Wall Street giant. The the firm will now operate five main businesses and eliminate the three regional chiefs who oversaw operations in about 160 countries. Jane Fraser says the shakeup will have a big impact on the business. The changes are the most consequential changes to how city will be organized and run that we've made in almost 20 years. And what this move enables me to do is not only flatten the organization, but it also enables me to be much more directly involved in making sure that those businesses are performing. Citigroup CEO Jane Fraser spoke at the Barclays Global Financial Services Conference. Well, we now take you to Europe, Nathan, where the ECB is in focus. The central bank and its president, Christine Lagarde, make an interest rate decision this morning. And Bloomberg's U.N. Potts is in London with a preview. Good morning, U.N. 
Good morning, Karen and Nathan. It's a cliffhanger decision day for the European Central Bank. Economists in Bloomberg survey are split down the middle as to whether the 20 countries in the euro area will get a tenth straight rate hike or a pause. Traders are leaning toward a 25 basis point increase. They're pricing in a roughly two in three chance that the ECB hawks win the day. We'll find out how this story ends at 7.15am New York time. In London, I'm Ewan Potts, Bloomberg Radio. You and thank you. And as global central banks try to manage inflation, Ray Dalio says bonds are no longer a good long term buy. The Bridgewater founder says he currently prefers cash. It's not just the supply demand isn't just the amount of new bonds. It's the issue of do you choose to sell the bonds? Mm -hmm. I personally believe that the bonds longer term are not a good investment. Ray Dalio spoke at the Milken Institute Asia Summit in Singapore. All right, Nathan, thank you. And it's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's John Tucker. John, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Karen. Hurricane Lee has barreled north toward New England. It's threatening to unleash violent storms in the region. This comes just as communities in Massachusetts and Rhode Island were dealing with tornado warnings and another day of heavy rain that opened up sinkholes and brought devastating flooding to several communities. The National Hurricane Center issued a hurricane watch for portions of Maine. A tropical storm watch was issued for a large area of coastal New England, from parts of Rhode Island to Stonington, Maine, including Block Island, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. The two-week-long nightmare for residents in southeast Pennsylvania has come to an end after an escaped convicted murder. Donaldo Calavacente was finally apprehended yesterday. Calavacente tried to get away as officers moved in, crawling under thick underbrush with a loaded rifle. But a Customs and Border Control team released a canine named Yoda to capture him. The dog sub- subdued him, and team members from both of those teams immediately moved in. And that's George Bivens of the Pennsylvania State Police. For the first time in days, schools and businesses in the area will reopen. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says it was unlikely Republican frontrunner Donald Trump could win the White House if he's convicted in his criminal trials. I think the chance of getting elected president after being convicted uh, of a felony is is as close to zero as you can get. DeSantis was interviewed on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. The U.S. and Iran are set to exchange prisoners as early as Monday. This is an agreement that's seen as a first step toward fresh talks to reimpose limits on the country's nuclear program. The deal, which also saw the U.S. allow Iran to access $6 billion in funds that were frozen, it's already opened President Biden up to criticism that he's encouraging more hostage-taking and shouldn't be doing any sort of deal with the regime. Global News, 24 hours a day. We're powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Tucker. This is Bloomberg. Karen. All right, John, thank you. It's time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update. Here's John Stash Hour. John. Karen, the first team to clinch a spot in the baseball postseason, a team that has now been there six straight years. Ready with a 2-2. Here it comes. Got him swinging strike three. And the Braves are National League East champions for the sixth year in a row. What an amazing era we're in the midst of. As it has been a six-year run of dominance in the East, and the Braves can celebrate right here in Philadelphia on the Phillies' home field. 6:80 a.m. The fan had the call. Braves beating the Phillies four to one. The Braves are 96 and 50, and Spencer Strider is 17 and five. He got the win in the clinching victory. Nationals lost in Pittsburgh seven to six. The Orioles shut out at home by the Cardinals one to nothing, and lost ground to Tampa Bay, who won its game. Red Sox rained out with the Yankees. At Fenway Park doubleheader today. Giants a 10 inning win over Cleveland, six to five. They were down five to one in the second inning. They tied the game on a JD Davis three run homer in the eighth inning. The A's lost in Houston six to two, and a big win for the Texas Rangers. They suddenly won five in a row behind Jordan Montgomery and three home runs. They won ten nothing at Toronto. Week two in the NFL begins tonight with Minnesota at Philadelphia. Two NFC division winners last year, though the Vikings lost their first playoff game. The Eagles, of course, made it to the Super Bowl. They're without a couple of players tonight. Injured, Kenneth Gainwell, the running back and cornerback, James Bradbury. John Stash, our Bloomberg Sports. From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, 
Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. We are counting down to a couple of key events that could have ripple effects for markets. Midnight tonight is when an auto workers strike could begin in Detroit. And at the opening bell this morning, British chip designer Arm Holdings makes its U.S. debut on the NASDAQ in Wall Street's biggest IPO of the year. Covering it all for us is Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. And Kriti's with me now. Kriti, good morning. Let's start with the strike deadline. We did hear from the United Auto Workers president last night and the uh, CEO of Ford as well. Where do things stand in the negotiations? Yeah, it's it's looking like it's going to be kind of that 11th hour deadline or, or basically that you're going to say because look we are literally counting down less than 24 hours before the contract that by the way is a multi-year contract completely expires we're not making much progress Nathan and that's really the concern for a lot of car makers around the world actually and not just in the states as well because of course this is going to specifically impact the auto workers uh, that are in Detroit the big three your four GM and Stellantis representing about 150,000 people but ultimately look what it does to the other car makers around the world. Mercedes-Benz, for example, being very, very vocal about this, saying, look, this is going to have industry-wide ramifications. Nathan, the logic here is very simple. If you don't have these union workers, if they are striking 150000 suddenly the price of labor for those who are not in the union goes up significantly, not just for the big three, but for all the car makers. And that's going to ultimately feed into consumer prices. And that's something at a time when a lot of car makers are really having a hard time selling their cars. Now, we've talked about the potential damage that this could do to the U.S. economy, the idea that Michigan could even enter a recession if yeah. the strike lasts for just a few days. Are we seeing any give from either the union or the automakers on their offers? We saw a little bit of give from the union. They did lower their pay demand from about 40 percent, uh, but it is going from about 46% to about 36% when you kind of compound it for a, a lot of uh, the other benefits that they have. But keep this in mind, at the end of the day, they are basically trying to use the same playbook that UPS had used. The problem is this is not UPS and Teamsters. This is a very different industry with a lot more workers available uh, that UPS had. The ramifications are smaller relative to UPS, but obviously still uh, quite a big deal. So right now, it looks like the union is kind of on the defensive. You aren't seeing a ton of give from the car makers at the moment. Ford, GM, Stellantis, all united in that front. But look, anything can happen. Before the strike deadline, we're waiting for Arm Holdings' debut on the NASDAQ. Looks like SoftBank, the company's owner, is getting pretty much what it wanted from the IPO. Yeah, they're about to make a, a pretty penny out of this entire deal. But I got to say, we've really got to watch the valuations here because what's significant is that initially when this IPO was first marketed, it was the expectation was about 60 to $70 billion is what the IPO would be. That is coming down to about $4.87 billion. We'll call it $5 billion to be generous here. The questioning around that valuation, the initial thought is, well, perhaps that means that the ARM demand isn't as strong, even though now you are, of course, seeing orders about 10 times subscribed, according to Bloomberg reporting. On the flip side, note that this is kind of what happens with IPOs. When you look at the banking process here, it is very normal for bankers to underprice the IPO so that when it actually debuts, the price skyrockets. The question is, does it stay there? At the end of the day, you've seen this with a lot of major tech IPOs, Airbnb, DoorDash, um, among others. And ultimately, what ends up happening is that in that process, in a few months later, the stock ends up dropping pretty significantly. A lot of folks are saying this is not like every other tech IPO, but there's there's the pattern for you, Nathan. In the time we have left, we got to talk about this hack that's uh, affected the casino industry. More than one company now apparently dealing with the same cyber attack from the same group. Um, and, and a little bit of a scary one, Nathan. The, the name of the group behind both attacks is Scattered Spider, otherwise known as UNC3944, according to the people. Basically, it's a group of social engineers that are trying to gain access to fairly large corporate networks. And to your point, very successfully, Caesars Entertainment, MGM Resorts are just some to the point that Caesars Entertainment had to pay tens of millions of dollars to the hackers. MGM as well had to pay a pretty significant amount. Now, of course, this is something that we've been talking about. There have been worries about cybersecurity, not just for the casinos in the States, but around the world. Remember, a lot of these casino makers or casino uh, 
sorry, owners have massive presences in Macau, among other places as well. And cybersecurity has been something that they and their earnings calls have been spending a lot of money on. What's interesting here is that usually when you look at hackings, they're asking to be paid in cryptocurrency, specifically if it's ransom. Sometimes they'll use things like locking up computer files. They'll do asking for decryption keys. There's a lot of different ways this goes. This seems to be a very specific uh, type of hack and, of course, putting a lot of the community on edge. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM Channel 119, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.